Great. Welcome everyone to this 2020 Goal Makers Conference and this session on uh, feminist leadership. This is our panel uh, that will be sharing with you how we can address all the world's challenges by embodying feminist leadership. And I was actually reflecting this morning that 2020 is a fascinating prism in which to view our progress towards equality because the COVID pandemic has exposed so many of the cracks and inequities that are in our systems, built into our systems. And a few months ago, a study that was published by the World Economic Con Forum confirmed what many of us have already suspected if we've been reading the news, that COVID-19 deaths in countries that are led by women are significantly lower than countries that are led by men, which perhaps tells us something about the power of feminist leadership in these times. So a few years ago, Sweden became the first country to announce an explicitly feminist foreign policy, meaning a leadership approach that is supportive and inclusive of those most marginalized due to their gender identity. And at the time, Sweden's announcement was met with a bit of skepticism and even laughter. But a few years later, Canada followed suit and then Mexico squarely putting gender equality as a priority objective. And in order to achieve the sustainable development goals, which is what so much of this conference is about today, a feminist approach needs to be fundamental to the program design, to the implementation, and to the leadership. So today we're going to talk about progress and opportunities for a more equitable future. And for this conversation, we're joined by three fantastic panelists who each have a wealth of experience to share on what this actually looks like in practice. I'm not going to read all of their bios because you already have that uh, in the app, but I do encourage you to read their bios because they're incredible. Um, so we have Mary Ellen Iskandarian, the CEO of Women's World Banking, Robin Jorgensen, the founder and CEO of Women Igniting Change, and Marie Noel Kaiser, the co-founder and vice president of We Forest. So to kick it off, I wanted to send a question to all of the panelists as an opener. For the past few years, Global development experts have talked about the importance of putting women at the center of intervention and using a gender lens in development approaches. So I'd love to know from each of your perspectives, how has this been actualized and what progress have you actually seen made? Robin, maybe we can start with you. Well, we definitely have a long, long way to go still. Um, you know, as I was reflecting on this question and trying to find progress, um, first, let me talk about an opportunity. I think here in the United States specifically, with a new administration coming in, we have an incredible opportunity to um, reassert ourselves on the global stage as it relates to global gender equality um, as a country. So that's very exciting. And I think where progress has most been seen has been in the grassroots efforts. You know, grassroots organizations tend to be more nimble. They tend to be more agile. Um, and they're really able to flex and pivot as needed, especially in this global pandemic times. You know, one of the organizations that I can think of is Frontier Markets in India, where they, they use solar power and going directly to the women specifically and having these women sell these lights to other women in the community versus typically working with the men who they're the salespeople, they're the marketing arm, they're meeting in the villages, the women typically aren't included. So they decided to completely pivot and go directly to the women to make sure that not only was the money getting into the women's hands for what they were selling, but they were really doing the A to Z approach of selling these products. So I think the grassroots organizations is really where progress has been made. And at the institutional level, we certainly still have a long way to go but there's definite hope moving into 2021. Great, thank you. Um, Mary Ellen, would you like to go next? Thanks so much, Rada, and it's really, it's great to be, to be here with you today. Um, you know, uh, Women's World Bank, Banking is very focused on uh, women's economic empowerment, specifically through their financial inclusion. And I, I think financial inclusion really is one of those um, overarching issues that has made enormous progress over the last decade or so. But having said that, and given that, you know, when we first started talking, we were talking over 2 billion people with completely without access to financial services, the gender gap in financial inclusion has absolutely not budged in in aggregate worldwide it's nine percent um and 
in many developing countries, it is actually widened. And that's because so much of the pro process, uh, excuse me, progress has been attributable to um, digital technology, which is an, an extraordinary development and is really allowing us to reach that last mile in a way and at a, and at a cost that we were never even could have imagined back in the old sort of microfinance days. But that that technology is also sort of a got a, a real gender gap to it as well. Again, only an 8% gender gap if you're thinking about cell phones overall, but again, the vast majority of um, financial inclusion products and the way financial inclusion is being delivered is through the smartphone. And there, the gap worldwide, again, gender gap 20%, but in some countries, you know, closer to 30%. Women may be able to get the sort of leftover flip phone when the husband upgrades to, uh, to, to the, the smartphone. But what we know pretty much everywhere in the world is women won't bank or won't Commit, you know, do financial transactions on a shared phone or want a phone that it, it isn't one that they own themselves. So, you know, there's been huge technology driven progress, but until we close that technology gap, women's financial inclusion is really not going to be um, achievable. Thank you. I think that's a really important note for much of the audience who's listening in Seattle and happens to be in the tech sector. I right, think planting right. a seed for people to be addressing that issue. <laughs> um, Marie Noel, um, what kind of progress have you seen? Yeah, well, we have seen some progress, but there is so much to do, to do still. We have seen progress because the organizations like WeForest, that for, in the case of WeForest, we develop large forest landscape restoration in developing countries. So we are in touch with rural communities and our focus is to put women at the center. So we've seen it work. So we see that other NGOs are applying the same recipes if you want, because it just works to put women at the center because it helps re relieve poverty. It helps empower the women and transform the communities. So that, that is one of the reasons, just because it works. The other one is there is high demand. Your donors, your sponsors, they want to see women equality. So you have to do it. Even if another NGO didn't want to do it, well, you don't get funding if you don't do that. It's just become best practice in our sector, right? And when I look at how we do it, typically, uh, as an NGO, we lead by example. We are, as we forest, um, primarily women. I mean, they're men, but you know, the leadership is strong in women. We have an opportunity when we go out there in those communities to train people because we train them on different skills. And obviously when you do that, you train them also on the values and the, the equalities and what you expect from that community. So that's a huge opportunity that we have, a huge lever. We also provide opportunity up, uh, opportunities for jobs like employment. So we target specific women and we stimulate uh, leadership and entrepreneurship for women. We also do positive discrimination. When we provide services, we target women, especially female uh, like families led by women, by single women. So all of that is what the other NGOs also do. So we're getting somewhere, but obviously there is still a lot to cover. Indeed. Thank you so much, all of you, for that opening question and, and glimpse into where we're seeing a bit of progress and where we need to be sharpening our lens. Um, Robin, this is an opportunity to, to learn a little bit more about your area of work because you're each coming from such different approaches and yet there are very strong similarities and themes in the work that you're doing. So moving from the idea of services for women, in low and middle income countries to embracing the concept of actual, actualizing feminist leadership. What do you think are the elements that are needed to achieve gender equality, the shift from for women to by women? Right, how much time do we have? 
<laughs> well, today for the start of the conversation, exactly. approximately five minutes, but off yeah, exactly. Forever. Oh my God, there there are so many, but I'll highlight I'll highlight the top five. I think the number one is that we have got to address the systemic underlying barriers that that are the root cause of gender inequality. You know, so many times when we go into a corporate setting and we're we're delivering programming or we see other avenues of programming be delivered, it's based on on equity, but it's excuse me, it's based on parity. But parity is not equality and equality is not inclusion. So there's there's a vast difference between the three of those. So making sure that <clears throat> in any setting we're addressing the power dynamics that are at the root cause. We're making sure that we are addressing economic opportunities for women, that we're not just putting programming band-aids on issues without addressing the root cause. So that's number one. Number two, I would say is openness and transparency. You know, you mentioned Rada earlier, during this COVID crisis, the countries that have been led by women are the ones that are doing the best because they have that feminist approach and they have that openness and transparency approach as well. They're very authentic. They're saying, here's how we're doing. Here's where we're not doing well. Just open above board. So having that openness and transparency, I think, is really crucial. Getting women and even girls in the decision making realm is absolutely vital. We have to get women to the table making decisions in the political landscape, in the corporate landscape, in the global development landscape, because if they're not at the table, we're just perpetuating the same thing. So getting women at the decision making table, recognition of unpaid care work huge, especially right now in the global pandemic, women are, they're burning out. You know, one in four women are deciding to leave the workforce here in the US because it's just too much. So recognition of unpaid care work, I think is another one. And then the influence of media and the influence of media perpetuating gender stereotypes and norms and doing our best to again, having women at the seat of the table with the decision-making into how media is distributed, what it looks like, making sure that those power imbalances and dynamics are addressed so that we can actually see a more um, gender neutral and gender centric approach to media versus perpetuating those stereotypes. So those would be the top five. That was amazingly succinct. I felt like you could have gone on and given a list I of another hundred. Absolutely, <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you so much for that. I think we're gonna end up coming back to that later in the conversation. Um, but first, uh, Mary Ellen, question for you. Um, from your perspective, why is intersectional feminist leadership needed to achieve economic security in low and middle income countries? Um, well, Rada, I loved your characterization earlier about uh, for women to buy women and, and moving in that direction. And we we see both in our work at Women's World Banking and and in research from you know the IMF to you know anyone else who's looking at this issue that you know female representation and diverse female representation in financial institutions you know, it's not only good for those institutions. I mean, there's been some really fascinating um, work done on financial stability. And during the last financial crisis, those, um, those banks that had more than one woman on their board actually came through the crisis better, were in sort of more uh, less precarious states going into the financial crisis and then came through it um, you know, with greater stability. Um, but I think the, the word intersectional, I think immediately calls up the complexity of ensuring economic security for, for women and how, and, I, and what we've all read the, again, the research that, that talks about the absolutely essential part that diverse leadership plays in solving complex problems in, in particular. And, and I think just understanding right from the get-go that there really is no such thing in as gender neutrality or gender blindness. You know, there's been some, you know, some really uh, uh, 
funny, but also sad um, stuff that's emerged through the, the pandemic about, you know, PPE only being designed for, you know, one set of um, physical characteristics and they weren't women's. Um, you know, there's this sense that the default when you, when you're calling something gender neutral, gender blind, the default is as uh, Carolina Criado Perez, who's the uh, author of uh, Invisible Women, a book I urge everyone to read. Um, but she says the default is to maleness and whiteness. And, and I think that there's a lot there that we can take with us as we think about what would gender intentional um, policy uh, uh, economic approaches really, really look like. Um, we've got great research that's showing what happens when you move, say, a government welfare payment from head of household to directly making that payment to targeting it to a woman. Everybody in the household does better. There's better, better health outcomes, better nutrition outcomes, more of the family members go to school and stay in school. So, so there, there's real, real difference when you, when you actually call out um, gender. Uh, I can't agree more with Robin on essentially any policy that doesn't take the un, unpaid care burden into consideration just isn't gender neutral and isn't really grappling with the way the world actually actually works. And something that I only recently knew, I, I knew that um, that unpaid care was not ever calculated in a country's GDP. Um, some places like Sweden are really starting to think um, in those terms. But you know, it's not. I mean, it's, it's so ironic that this this focus on domestic care is not considered part of gross domestic product. But what's also almost more, you know, insult to injury is that that um, spending at the national account level, spending on child care. Um, is, is sort of lumped in with consumption. And so when a government is sort of looking at an austerity, austerity program or, or making budget cuts and something that I think we are all gonna have to take, pay particular attention to in the aftermath of, uh, of COVID as so many governments have stepped up to the plate and made um, relief payments available to so many citizens, when those um, consumption items get cut, you're cutting childcare in the in in the bargain. So I think the 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 need for a leadership that is gender intentional, gender aware, um, is going to absolutely be be essential, particularly coming out of this um, this crisis environment. I couldn't agree more. Thank you so much, Mary Ellen, for sharing that. Um, I I am reflecting on that question now. What would a, a gender intentional kind of policy look like? And how can we begin incorporating that as our baseline standard? I love it. Um, Marie Noel, we're just shifting here from SDG five to one, and now we're gonna jump to 13 and talk a bit about climate change. Um, so this, I think we all know is an, is an issue that impacts every one of us. This is our, our home, <laughs> um, but it doesn't necessarily impact all of us equally. So can you talk with us a little bit about how women are impacted differently and disproportionately by climate change and how intersectional feminist leadership could help guide some climate action going forward? Yeah, so the first part of your question is how are women impacted and statistics show that women are disproportionately affected by climate change. Actually, 80% of people displaced by climate change are women. That's what some of the official statistics show. So it's, uh, it's bad for everybody, but it's worse in the countries that we're talking about for women, obviously, and women and children and everybody. And so the question is, you know, what, what can we do? How can we guide climate action? What should change? And unlike, you know, Robin and Mary Ellen, we're talking about big policies. I'm going to refer to something really on the ground with the local communities of farmers, of rural population that we're working with, because I think it is a very different approach and it is as important. So what we've, we're seeing is that we're coming to communities where there's this, uh, these difficulties for women, and we learn that 
we've got to tailor solutions. We cannot come in uh, and expect women and men to have the same needs and work in the projects where we offer employment opportunities the same way because they have different needs uh, that are specific to their groups, the way they use fuel, wood, water, uh, cooking, vegetable, gardening, the, their activities there is very different from men. So we have to always keep that in mind that we can't have the same recipes, the same activities for men and women. We also are seeing that we cannot come with solutions ourselves. We've got to address their issues and question what is your culture? What do you need, right? And so we have, uh, I have my colleague who went, for example, in a, an, an event or a gathering of communities in DRC, and we were trying to get people engaged and, and act for climate. And she realized that women weren't there, they weren't listening, they weren't participating until we separated them and we gave them a voice and they were able to express what their concern was. And their concern was very different, was about the family planning and how they deal with the number of kids they have. They weren't really interested in resolving the other things until that was resolved. And we wouldn't have gotten anywhere if we'd kept women and men together because they would have been shy and they wouldn't have been I wouldn't have been heard. So it's like, it takes a lot of talent to dig and find what is the solution for women with women, right? The other thing is uh, reforestation, the activities that we do is seen very often as hard science. So then women stay away from that. They stay shy. We've got to show that it's for everybody to participate and to benefit from. And so that, that's kind of the lessons we learned. There's, you've got to go with a different lens and you've got to ask what they need. You've got to listen to the women because we don't know, we Westerners don't know what people in Ethiopia and Zambia, what women in Zambia and Senegal need. I think that's an excellent point and probably central to the work that all of us are doing if we're doing any kind of work in, in international development, right? The very first thing you learn is don't make any assumptions that you're Truth and what you're experiencing is the same as anybody else's, and you have to ask people directly what it is that they want. Um, it's fascinating to me and also really wonderful. You've all been so succinct in your answers to these questions that we have a little bit of extra time. So now, uh, moderator's choice, I would love to pose another question to all of you um, that has to do with how we are going to marshal the resources needed to do so much of the work that each of you are in. For many years in my um, career, I was focused much more on the advocacy side. How do you communicate and translate adequately information to get policymakers to move and take action and found myself shifting towards more private resources? What can you do to encourage people who have the resources that are maybe not part of larger bureaucracies to act quickly, to invest in areas where it can really make a difference um, and where you can be a bit more nimble and flexible. So um, if I were to ask each of you, what would you say to a private philanthropist that had a few million dollars to invest? What would you want them to know about investing in feminist leadership and something that you think would really help move the needle towards gender equality? Robin, maybe I'll start with you. <laughs> with just with that easy question. That's all. That, that's such a great question, though, you know, as you were saying that, uh, because, you know, we're, we're creating an economic empowerment center for women in Rwanda called the Cora Women's Center. I'm like, I would like put that right toward our center. No. Um, <laughs> I, there's a couple of things. Um, that is definitely the direction to go, because as you said, they're more nimble, nimble, they're more agile. I think the crucial thing is data, and we don't have enough of it. So the number one thing would be to make sure that not only are we providing, you know, this particular philanthropic organization, the proper data, but we have to make sure that we can get access to it. And we have to make sure that it's segmented in such a way that it's sliced and diced in so many different fashions that they can really see the intersectionality of how their philanthropic dollars are going to be actually leveraged. So I think that's number one. And number two is, you know, 
to Marina Wells point, some organizations are really passionate about each of the SDGs, right? So making sure that you find those organizations that share the same passion that you do around whichever SDG it actually is. Now we all know that all 17, of course, gender is at the center of all of them. Um, but really finding those right fit organizations where the passion is already there and the alignment is already there. Um, so data is one. Two is making sure that you can include them in some way. So if they're not able to, you know, go to Africa, they're not able to get to Thailand, what are some ways that you can include them in the process to really see the effect and the impact of what their dollars are actually doing? You know, whether that's through virtual reality or some type of experience if they're not able to travel there because none of us can at the moment, to really make sure that they can see and feel that impact. And then showing them the long-term vision of what those dollars can actually do and the the effect that it can have on not only the, the women themselves, but the family and the community. Because as we all know on this call, women you know, invest 95% back into their family, back into their community. So show them the ripple effect of that 2 million can actually equate to 10 and 20 and the significance of that. So those would be a couple. Those are great. Thank you so much. Um, Mary Ellen, what would you like to add to that? Well, I would just really love to, to underscore and double down on the data point. Um, the, and it, it's very, very evident in, in our field of financial inclusion, but I don't think there's anywhere that, that you know, anyone working on any of these challenges feels like there's adequate data that we, as you say, Rama, we all have access to, um, that is gender disaggregated, that really shows what, what women's experience with whatever issue um, you're, you're dealing with. In, in the financial world, Chile really is the only country that has been collecting data um, on a gender disaggregated basis from the banks in, in that country for like 30 years. And it's really allowed them to make smart um, choices about the way women use money, the way women, um, what, what their needs are. They found that when women borrow, um, they were much more likely to borrow for housing than, than men. Um, and so they were able to, the government was able to structure uh, housing support products to, um, you know, to, to, to buttress that, that asset ownership, because we know that that's another thing that women tend to have less of than men is less ownership of, of hard assets, less, less wealth um, in uh, uh, asset wealth. Um, so I would definitely you know, sort of double down on that, um, on the data point. And then maybe just to, to add, you know, let's say your, your philanthropist is really engaged in closing that technology gap. They were uh, based here in Seattle and they heard the, the, the great story about technology and we started to, cl to close that gap. Even with that phone in her hand, if she doesn't really understand how to use it um, and isn't confident in her digital skills, a woman is not really truly going to have the benefit of those, those digital financial services. So I think a, a global investment in broadening women's both, both financial literacy, but now also digital literacy would be um, a, you know, a, a great way to make sure that that technological investment really does pay off. Beautiful, digital literacy, I love it. Okay, <laughs> thank you so much for that perspective. Um, Marina Well, uh, what do you think that uh, would be an important thing for someone with private wealth who'd be able to quickly move money, or let's hope they would be able to quickly move money towards gender equality? Mm -hmm. uh, what would be important for them to hear? Yeah, um, the reason why we went into reforestation is that we know that when the landscapes are restored, everybody benefits, especially the women and the children. Uh, it lifts them out of extreme poverty, creates uh, jobs with dignity. And so if I was talking to a philanthropist, I would say there's many good things you can do restoring the planet for climate and at the same time be able to lift millions of, of villagers out of poverty is uh, an amazing uh, move, I would say. So combining the two. 
And then coming back to the data topic, we obviously you can always do with better data, but we do work on data because it is essential. And so whenever we go somewhere and we start, you know, restoring the landscape, we have a baseline and we see who's living there, who is, uh, you know, single with children, who is poor, what's the level of poverty, how much do they get as a living, and then we measure the impact. And we want more of that, obviously, I fully agree with Robin and Mary Ellen, but already uh, we have quite some data to show that doing you know lands forest landscape restoration really pays really works i would like to come back to with one example though which is again don't come with your solutions from the western world i have an amazing story where you know some people in mali had been funding uh, freshwater wells for women thinking it will it will help them so they don't have to go and carry the water. The girls go very far, the women, to fetch the water, right? So that was a solution that they thought was wonderful. But actually, they were shocked when they saw that the women at some point started destroying these wells. Why do you think they did that? Because they understood very quickly that this was a quality time they had with women alone away from man, away from responsibility with the family, just quality time for them to be together. And that was gone because they couldn't go to the well to, to fetch the water. They had to you know, use the well. So what I want to say here is, again, you might resolve one problem, but create others. So we don't know what the solutions are. Again, as I was saying before, let's go and listen to what these women need and we'll do an amazing job. Mm. That was fantastic and such a perfect segue to this next question. I can't believe how beautifully you set this up. I did not pay her to do this, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> okay. um, or the new phrase I've started using is ladies and gentle thems. Yes. So part of the conversation that's that's happening at this whole Goalmakers Forum um, this week is about how we can decolonize global development. And you just started to share a really great example of that. Are there places where you have seen um, intersectional feminist leadership transform the development sector and really start to get at that root power imbalance? You have other models or examples like this example of what can happen when you are not asking communities about the wells that you're designing for them and not with them. Do you have examples or models that you'd like to share of what you've seen that's worked? Um, Robin, I guess I'll start with you again, <laughs> since we've got a good rhythm. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I can give a couple of examples. Um, and these are both examples in Rwanda. One is an organization called Shooting Touch. And their whole mission is to get more children into sports, basketball specifically. So, you know, they're, they're in the eastern province of Rwanda. They're setting up this program and naturally more young men started coming to the program and their entire goal was to get a more balanced approach and have more young women approaching. So they did a couple of things. They made sure that they were hiring more female basketball coaches to entice more young women to the program. They held female empowerment curriculum specifically for the young women. They made sure that gender training was included with their entire staff to make sure that everyone understood that gender lens approach. And by doing all of these things, they were able to increase young female participation from 10 to 72% in three years. So that's pretty incredible. And another organization is owned by a dear friend of mine. It's called Paper Crown, and it's owned by a young woman named Katie Carlson, who's an incredible international gender specialist. And they have a program called My Voice, My Power. It's a five month program and it's for young women and for young men. And as part of this, again, getting at that, the societal norms and the root issues at the very bottom. The whole program is based on trying to prevent teenage pregnancy. It's based on sexual reproductive health education. It's based on GBV prevention. So for the young women, they have defense training, they have training around empowerment, having the women see that they have just as much value as the young men in their community and having them actually feel that worth. 
They do training specifically for the young men, having them see and understand that they too can go home and take care of household chores. It doesn't just have to be their sisters and their mothers that are actually doing it. So it's really having that combined approach of the young men and the young women together and really uprooting those gender norms and having them work together. So that's another great example. Thank you so much. Yeah. Fantastic. Love it. Mary Ellen, do you have an example or a model that you've seen work well? Um, well, first, I very much want to thank Maria Noel for, for, for reminding us that we really know very little about anybody else's shoes, anybody else's lives. And the most important thing we can do is, is ask and then listen. Um, so I, I, I very much agree. And, and I think I'm, I'm fortunate that Women's World Banking is 41 years old this year. And from our founding, we were always about a, a being a, a network, being an association, a collection of local financial institutions. And our role really at the center is to share what's being learned across um, you know, a, a, across the globe, across uh, institutions of different types. I think one of the most exciting things that we're, we're seeing kind of bubbling up that we're trying to share um, as broadly as possible is, um, you know, some of the really interesting work that's come out of India as a result of the, the COVID crisis. Um, India and Peru were the only two countries in the world that targeted their COVID response directly to women. Their, their, their payments were made directly to women. And we've seen that women banking agents, so not necessarily people who sit in bank branches, but who are in the community, but, but women in the community and from the community have been extraordinarily important in making sure that you know, if a woman didn't have a bank account to have that government payment deposited, that she was helped to open that. But what we're also finding is that men seem to really enjoy working with the women agents. They feel better able to ask questions, particularly around technology with the cell phone, that they may not necessarily understand all the functionality and they're willing to ask a woman maybe that they're when they're not at, willing to ask another man. Um, and we've seen you know, and I always hope somehow that the business case will sort of win the day, but we've seen these women agents having much better um, records in terms of, you know, someone walks into their, their shop or the, the stand where they're working, they have better rate of transforming them to, to sign up for accounts better rates of actually more frequent and larger account balances, and then better um, a better track record at cross-selling other, other services like insurance, which is particularly important, um, you know, as we think about resilience to this and to future and to future crises. So I'm hoping that that business case can be shared with as many organizations and that if it does make sense um, to come out of the, out of the locality that it, it works. But certainly in India, we've seen this um, really exciting development where the, the women are, the women agents are really making a difference. I love that example. And I didn't know that about Peru and India. So now yeah. I'm, I'm curious to read more. I find that that really fascinating. Um, great. And Marie Noel, we're going to return to you for more examples and models that are going to uplift and inspire all of us about things that we've seen that have worked and what yeah. we might also be able to try to adapt in our own fields. Well, what Mary, and Mary Ellen was saying about India, we have worked with some communities for example, in the Cassie Hills, uh, an indigenous community, the border of Nepal. And this is, this is very inspiring to us because it's an, a community that is led by women. And they have seen the, you know, their environment totally degraded over the decades. And a few years ago, just decided to go and take care of it and started planting trees. So that's for us very inspiring, started by women, with women, and they drive it and it's super successful. We see the same, for example, in Senegal, where uh, you know women living at the coast, where uh, there were they used to have mangroves, and then mangroves died. I mean, people cut them to make firewood, and there was no fish anymore, no shellfish, and they started to recognize the link, obviously, between 
a degraded source of income and no food anymore and the degraded mangroves. So they also started to take care of and replanting. And those are the kind of initiatives we like to fund because it is so anchored in their values and it's driven by the women and then they engage the youth that we know that whatever contribution we make to these communities, it will succeed. So if any philanthropist is looking to make a difference, it will look for projects and communities that have been started by women and you won't be disappointed. So perfectly said, I love that. It's interesting as you were sharing examples, I was thinking about some of what I've seen in, in some of the countries that you've mentioned as well. So much of that resonated with me. And we haven't talked much in this discussion today about uh, the role of girls as well, but I was thinking about one example in which um, I worked for an organization that made a small grant investment that was by a very unusual grant applicant. It was a group of teenage trafficking survivors in Nepal who had miraculously escaped their conditions and wanted to rebuild their lives amidst a, a lot of challenges within society um, about their future options after having lived through that experience. And they requested a small grant, I think around $10,000 so that they could become paralegals and they would use their training to work in police stations alongside police officers so that they could help stop the cycle of violence in their community that was recruiting girls from primarily poor areas and offering them lucrative opportunities that turned out to be something far different than what they were told. And when this project first started, you can imagine that the response from law enforcement was, we do not need a bunch of teenage girls coming into our police stations. We've got this just fine, thank you very much. And within a few months, when the report started coming in, there was a huge, huge shift in the conversation. They were asking, can you send more? Because what they hadn't realized uh, at first was they suddenly saw a spike in what they thought was a crime spike and quickly realized was a reporting spike. Because now they had women and girls sitting outside of the police station so that every other woman and girl walking through the village would see there's somebody who looks like me, who shared my experience, who will believe me who will advocate for me and they felt comfortable coming forward. And it completely shifted trust in law enforcement for this entire community. And this was a very small intervention. Um, and so I think all of these examples that you've shared have really spoken to what can happen when you take business as usual, set it aside and really start to look at what are the root causes of so many of these power imbalances and what are some different things that we can try to get at that. So thank you all for, for sharing those examples. And um, I'm pleased that we have plenty of time for some participation and audience questions. And we already have a few that are lined up. Um, so I'm going to share the first one. And this question is directed for you, Marie Noel. Um, it's about asking you a little bit more about the disproportionate effect of climate change um, on women and girls, and why exactly do you think that is, that disproportionate effect? Because it's, uh, when we speak about women and girls, in this case, we speak often of women who've lost maybe their husband and they're in charge of their family. And in many countries, they're not even allowed to own land and to, you know, to drive a business, to cultivate their land. So they're totally dependent on aid. And so obviously they're much more vulnerable. And so it's the fact when they don't have a husband, who are they in the society? In many countries, they are nothing. Okay, well said. <laughs> I mean, you really got right to the heart of the issue and I, I appreciate it. Thank you for, yeah. for shining a light on that. Um, Question for Mary Ellen uh, about finance and gender. Um, and this question is really about sort of a broader 60,000 foot view. I think the question is about venture capital and why are we seeing so little funding going to women led companies and what can we do to change that boys club? 
Yeah, that is that's the that not only a sixty thousand foot view, but the sixty four thousand dollar question. Um, you know, I, I've seen some research that indicates that the number one determining factor of whether a company will get venture financing is if another woman, a woman owned company is if another woman is on the investment committee considering that that decision. So I think it gets back to our feminist uh, leadership question. We, we have just got to be out there in force, sitting in places where decisions get made. Um, we see things differently. We see businesses differently. We see uh, people as entrepreneurs and successful leaders differently. Um, and so I just would, would it really encourage um, anyone listening to, to think of themselves as a feminist leader, both men and women, but being in places where those decisions um, can can get made. Great, thank you so much. I think there's also real promise just in the fact that private wealth is really starting to shift. We're seeing that in this country. Um, and that is a, a fascinating trend, I think, that we should all be keeping our eyes on. Um, great, okay, we also have a question for Robin. Um, Robin, have you seen the same kind of transformational leadership that you were speaking about earlier from young women? And have you seen opportunities to involve young girls as leaders early on? A thousand percent. I, I think, you know, this generation of young women, first of all, they're absolutely incredible. You know, if you look at Malala Yousafzai, if you look at Greta Thurberg, like they're just they don't have the fear, I think, that Mary Ellen Marie Noel and I, and maybe you, you know, in our generation had growing up. They're just like, this is what needs to be done. We're gonna go and tackle it. If you'd like to join us, you're welcome to. Like that's that's their attitude, which is absolutely incredible. So I think more than ever, this generation of young women are seeing the challenges and the issues that need to be addressed. And they're just going at it and they're just taking names and they're just getting it done. So that's amazing. And I think the, the groundswell of other young women seeing the courage and the tenacity and the conviction that these young women have, they're like, you know what, I have an idea, I can do that too. So it's really creating this incredible global movement of young female change makers that are literally going to change the world. So absolutely 100%. And I think there's, there's a ton of organizations both here and globally that are solely focused on young women. One of them is in, you know, where I live in Atlanta called Girl Talk. And it's where um, teenage girls are mentoring middle school girls. And it was created by a young woman named Haley Kilpatrick at 13 years old. She created this organization, she's now 30. And it's now in like 70 countries around the world. But it's all around helping young women understand that they don't have to be bullied and all of the self-empowerment and conviction that they need to have in order to go be everything they're meant to be. So there's so many of those organizations out there that have summer camps and all of those types of things to really help them step in and own who they are and their worth and their value and do what they're here to do. So absolutely. Thank you so much. I love it. If, if others have questions, feel free to type them um, into the Q&A box over here. I'm kind of monitoring them as they go. So I just want to make sure that you have the opportunity to ask a question um, if you want to. But I, I'm thinking as you're talking also just about some of the opportunities that I've been seeing in, in recent years about organizations that have uh, diverse leadership taking a more, um, I think, outright feminist approach in being more collaborative rather than competitive. And really thinking about how each of us in our respective fields can be shifting from some of that scarcity mindset where we're all trying to compete for the resources to really broadening our perspective and thinking in an abundance mindset that there are resources for all and it's really important for us to think differently about how we share information and and work with one another and i'm really pleased to see that trend going um there's a new question that, that just popped in mary ellen this is for you if you could wave a magic wand which i'm sure you keep at your desk for, yes. for just <laughs> these moments right what would be the top two or three things you'd like to see governments implement to improve women's lives and prosperity? 
Oh, great. Really good question. Um, I, I think just to be a bit of a broken record on the gender disaggregated data, just if, if this just could be something that every regulator just insists that anybody that they have oversight over has to break the data down between men and women and then use it. Um, I, I think that would just be an enormous, enormous shift in terms of what we you know, what we know about women's financial and, and economic needs. Um, and then I think the second thing would probably be around um, ensuring that women have, um, well, ensuring that everyone in the country has a digital identification. It is, um, you know, there are a billion people around the world that don't have um, any identification at all. The vast majority of them are women. Um, but then when you think about um, if all you have is a paper-based identification, as more and more products, services, government services are being brought into the virtual realm, you're invisible. I mean, one thing that we saw with, with COVID is women are so much more disproportionately um, represented in the informal sector, small uh, women's small businesses. And so they were basically invisible to any government stimulus checks for small businesses. They just weren't seen. And so um, really getting serious about making sure that everyone in the country has that digital identification. It's a huge goal. It's a big project, but it's very doable. India has shown us um, that that it is it is possible. It's, it's usable. People under, you know, understand identity. It's so fundamental. Um, so that would probably be the, the second thing Thing that I would really um, love to use my my wand for. This is great. I wish that we had all gotten magic wands as part of doing this panel because they would really come in handy now. Um, great. So there are a couple of other questions. I'm using our time remaining here to think about um, how to fold these in, but I think we have time for them. One of them is um, about whether you see opportunities to address the issue of gender-based violence um, throughout the SDGs in any of the work that you do. And um, the question was a little bit broad, but certainly in the context of COVID, this is another area where we really do see a disproportionate gendered impact because people are forced into quarantine in closed quarters, um, potentially in some unsafe situations. So I'm gonna open this up for anybody um, who wants to answer. Are there ways that you're seeing this show up in your work um, and have that has that been exacerbated by COVID? And, and what do you think some of the response might be? I know it's a huge question. <laughs> well, perhaps I can speak just a bit to something that Marie Noel made reference to in, in um, women's ability to own land. Um, to own property outright in their in their own names. Um, ag again, there's some really interesting research that that shows, um, you know, basically putting in place um, an, an environment where women can leave an abusive relationship economically, including having title um, to to land, um, can be some of the most effective ways to combat gender-based violence. On, uh, you know, obviously in this COVID environment, very different um, scenario, even if you have the economic wherewithal in a lockdown situation, leaving is not necessarily um, an option. And nevertheless, there is some research that shows, you know, essentially if the, if the man knows he's gonna have to deal with you because of ownership issues, when if and when you do leave, it does, it can have a, um, uh, a countervailing effect on uh, on violent behavior on the on the part of men. I think just one other quick COVID thing that I've seen is as governments think about support to um, households in the time of COVID, there have been a couple of governments, Bosnia, for example, that provided additional support to. Um, uh, women, domestic violence shelters for, for women. So for, for governments to be conscious of what the sort of unique needs of women are in this entirely unique era that we're living through and targeting support for those things. 
great. Thank you for that. Does anybody else want to jump in on that one? Yeah, I think I'll just add, you know, a, a lot of GBV training is targeted toward women, but making sure that the training itself is also inclusive. So yes, of course, training the women, but making sure that you have couples training, making sure that men and women are going through GBV training, because as we mentioned before, those systemic barriers, a lot of times, you know, men have seen this passed down for generations, and it's just what they think they're supposed to do. But when they see the actual value in not doing gender-based violence and they actually see their family thriving as a result of it, they're like, oh, maybe I don't have to behave in this manner. So just making sure that training is inclusive of men and women to start shifting those dynamics. Great, thank you. Yeah, I also just wanted to note, there's an organization that it's US-based, but I think their work is expanding globally called Free From. Um, that is focused on the economic impacts of domestic violence um, on the economy and really looking at this as a, a public health crisis with economic implications. And they just did a study about some of the impacts during COVID and realized that the average amount of money that a woman needs to escape a dangerous situation with her family is about $734. So they're now starting to open conversations with some banks and other financial institutions, um, CDFCs, et cetera, to think about what it would take to help get resources more quickly to people in need in order to get out of those situations. And I thought it was a really beautifully quantified solution that can be laid at someone's doorstep to address very quickly. Okay, so I'm gonna jump to another question um, that was raised by somebody in the audience. And certainly this is a really powerful one. Um, 2020, I think, was a year that not only showed us the cracks in our systems around equality because of COVID, but also certainly in the history of the U.S. racial inequality and unrest and a real deep need to address anti-Black racism. So the question is, um, in light of the current civil rights chapter that, that 2020 has brought about, how are you looking at ways to champion and support Black feminist women in leadership in your agencies or just in your work in general? Where are you seeing opportunities to do that? And I think um, this may not be as applicable to you, Marie Noel, um, because you're outside of the US, um, but certainly I think we see the legacy of colonization all over the world. So um, I, who would like to start with this? <laughs> Another simple question that we're posing. <laughs> um, I'll go ahead and start. Uh, so a couple of things, you know, with, with our team specifically, you know, making sure that our team is diverse, making sure that we have women of color on our team that represent us in whatever work we do in the world, that's one. Two, making sure that we are bringing in, um, you know, black female women to do training for us on you know, unconscious bias training, making sure that we are educated and making sure, again, we've, we've said this the entire session, that we don't think we know all the answers. As a heterosexual white woman, I don't know all the answers. So making sure that you're open and listening and receiving training as well. And then, you know, we've actually had organizations, Fortune 500 companies who have come to us, and I love that this is the conversation now, who have come to us to do programming work in their organization. And literally from the very beginning, they will say out front, you know, if you don't have any women of color on your team, it's really nice to know you, but we can just stop the conversation right here. Five years ago, that would have never happened. So I love that that openness and transparency is there because they wanna make sure that anyone coming in and helping them with their training is represented and values the same thing that they do. So I absolutely love that. Um, and I think another is to just make sure that, you know, in our day-to-day e-commerce -day e lives of e-commerce, because that's all we can buy right now, everything that we do, be intentional with your wallet. Take the time to look up what you're purchasing and who you're purchasing it from. You know, we're all doing, Christmas shopping, holiday shopping on Amazon? Are you being intentional looking for specifically Black women-owned businesses and supporting them specifically getting the same product? That's probably even better. But you know that you're consciously supporting a Black woman-owned business. So being really intentional with your wallet, I would say, is another. That is a great and perfectly timed um, suggestion and recommendation for everyone, since I think this is the time when people are really doing that kind of spending with their wallets. So just a quick um, plug for two resources I can think of off the top of my head that are super helpful 
Um, Elevest, uh, started by the amazing Sally Krawcheck, has a number of different lists of businesses. Then you can look at businesses that are um, Latinx owned, that are BIPOC owned, that are LGBTQ owned. Um, it's a wonderful cross section. And here locally in Seattle, there's an organization called the Intentionalist. And you can use a drop down menu to sort by any category that you want. It's great for restaurants as well as shopping. And it's a wonderful resource to help you think very intentionally about where you're investing your resources. So I can share those in the notes for anybody who's who's interested. Um, Mary Ellen, is there anything else that you wanted to add to that last question? Well, that was a great answer, Robin. I got to say, I, what was what was kind of going through my mind is as you were speaking, because we are so much of our work is delivered by um, our teams in in the field. We are you know, in, in almost not de facto, but we are quite diverse and we have people of so many different um, ethnicities and races within the Women's World Banking team. But I think what we're really um, being quite mindful of right now is is maybe less the diversity side of the equation um not looking losing sight of that but but perhaps a little bit less and more on the inclusion side and making sure that these very diverse voices are heard are represented you know just the mere fact of you know there are there are staff members now that are doing some of our most amazing work in Southeast Asia, that there is never a time zone that we are, there's never a time of day that we're in sort of overlapping. How, how do I make sure as the leader of my organization that, that their experiences, that their work, that their leadership locally is, is being heard, is being recognized by the rest of the, the organization? Wonderful, thank you. Okay, I'm keeping an eye on the time here. And um, I know we only have a few minutes left in our conversation. Um, so I'm, I'm just wanted to take this moment to ask if there's anything else that you think would be worth valuable um, sharing with the audience today um, in these last few moments. We've had a, a rich conversation that has covered a lot of different topics. And we are talking about really big intractable issues that nobody has figured out how to solve yet. So I think we can cut ourselves a little bit of slack that we haven't solved it in the hour that we've been here together today. <laughs> but we have raised some promising examples and models that we could be looking at. And I think really good um, opportunities for us to be sharpening our pencils at the areas where we can really be moving the dial. Are there any other thoughts that you'd like to add um, and share with the audience today? I'll just add one quick comment. You know, in, in global development and in women's leadership in general, you can get very fatigued very easily because there's so much work to do, especially in the midst of a global pandemic. So I would say, you know, take the next couple of weeks toward the end of the year and do whatever you have to do to recharge yourself and refuel yourself because we need all of us everyone on this call, everyone at this conference, we need all of us to shift this narrative. So I would say recharge, rejuvenate, get ready to dive into 2021 and do whatever you need to do to make sure that you're ready to rock on January 1st because we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Zoom challenges of 2020, I'm back. Um, thank you so much, Robin, for that. Um, Mary Ellen or Marina Well, are, are there any other thoughts that you'd like to share? I wanna thank you for organizing this and I've learned a lot and I've taken a lot of notes that I will be sharing with my team. And remember 71% of us are women, so they'll all love it, but the men will love it as well. Thank you. Wonderful, and thank you for that reminder that when we're talking about feminist leadership, any person of any gender identity can be a feminist. Wonderful. Mary Ellen, anything else? Yes, I, I would just echo that, that um, mm -hmm. it, it, it is, it is going to take all of us. And we, the four of us were, were women, but it, it's going to take all of us. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you. That perfect use of your magic wand today as well. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you so much. So I just was noting through this conversation that we had that um, we covered a lot of ground. We talked about how the gender gap has not budged very much and is widening in some places and it's really going to take a concerted effort to move that forward. We talked about how parity is not equality and equality is not inclusion and we have to stay very focused on the differentiation in terms. Um, we talked about how there is no such thing as gender neutral. <laughs> And when people think that they are being gender neutral, that usually means white and male. And we talked about how we can really start to get at some of the, the root issues of power imbalances and start focusing on things like the gender data gap to help us get a little bit closer. And Marie Noel reminded us of one of the most important things in the work, which is you need to ask women in communities what they specifically need and never make the assumption that you know. So I really enjoyed the conversation with you all. I feel like we could do this a lot. This could be a really great group that has this kind of conversation. Thank you so much for sharing all of your, your knowledge and insights. And uh, I hope that you've enjoyed the conversation today. Thank you so much. Thank you, this has been great. Thank you, Rada. Okay, take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much to all of our panelists and our moderator for sharing their expertise with us today. You'll have a small break, everyone, before the next session begins. At 10 minutes after the hour, there's a panel on next-gen leadership for global development. Click on the agenda button in Whova and select that session to be connected. Thank you so much. Have a great one.